welcome everybody. I'll go ahead and uh, let Paul take over. Great. Thank you very much, Brittany. Um, no so hi, everybody. My name is Paul, and I'm uh, I'm an interpreter down here at Lake Erie National Park. And uh, Brittany and I were chit-chatting a little bit, and I started working here in 1994 um, as a part-time employee. But interestingly enough, my first hawk watch experience was actually in the fall of 1993. Um, when I was here as, as, as a patron and not as an employee, because I wasn't hired yet, um, hired, or I, I was here as a, as a, as a patron uh, at Hawkfest, which is a festival we do every fall in September. So I've seen hawk migration from both sides of the equation, both as a park interpreter as well as a uh, just a bird guy, if I can say it that way. So. Hopefully my program tonight will uh, give you some insight as to what's going on with hawk migration and why we do it and how you can do it and that sort of stuff. So, uh, Brittany, if you're gonna give me the green light, I can get started or would you like me to hang? We're gonna roll? Okay. So I'm gonna do the share screen thing and I uh, hope I do this right. Get rid of that, do that. and push that and there we go i can actually see you on the side of my screen there Brittany. so my screen looks okay great okay all right so we'll uh so we'll get rolling uh, first thing i wanted to square away is um i want to make sure everybody understands the uh the history of the hawk watch because if you go back through the literature you're going to see the name pop up in different capacities over different windows of time and it's all the same hawk watch. It's all the same concept here. So Lake Erie Metro Park Hawk Watch is how it started. And it was uh, completely a volunteer outfit. And then that switched over to uh, Southeastern Michigan Raptor Research, which was a 501c3, uh, which was uh, run by me for the most part during easily two thirds of its tenure. And then that eventually folded right in time to be taken over by the uh, United States Fish and Wildlife Service, um, which uh, specifically is the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge, which is right up the street from the park, and their friends group, the uh, International Wildlife Refuge Alliance. So this is now a contracted kind of a counter circumstance through the Fish and Wildlife Service. But if you look through the literature, these three names are all from the same place, which is right here at Lake Erie Metro Park. Um, I want to just briefly touch on this concept of uh, citizen science, and it's basically average people getting out and doing stuff cool, all in the name of science. That's really what it is. So whether you're a birder doing a bird survey, or in recent years, we've seen lots of uh, interest from the, uh, from the public with uh, butterflies or moths or dragonflies, which are hugely popular right now. And uh, astronomy as well, believe it or not. A lot of that is citizen science. A lot of these people spend their spare time literally looking for comments. Um, and it all contributes to the greater good of science. Well, it turns out that hawk watching is also uh, another capacity for citizen science. When it comes to this concept, uh, it's basically a standardized bird count. And in order for it to be standardized, you don't have the luxury of changing everything as the years go by. So you pick a location and you apply some protocols and you do your best not to change the protocols and you keep your records the same and you do it for the same period of time. So in our case, it would be September through November. And then you just keep doing it year after year after year after year after year. Um, and in doing so, you ultimately end up with this, um, with this data where you can actually get a feel for what's going on in the world. So this chart here represents what I suspect a lot of people are aware of, and that is, is the return of the bald eagle. They are uh, a species that was in dire, dire, dire troubles in the middle of the 20th century. And by the time we got to the early 21st century, we were starting to see some pretty fair returns. At the same time, if you look at the data from Cape May, New Jersey, they are actually uh, seeing a significant decline in the American kestrel. So the hawk watching data gives you the opportunity to kind of track these populations over time. 
What has to be considered though, is it shows you what is happening, but it doesn't show you why it is happening. So a classic example is this uh, bill deformity issue that popped up with bald eagles. This is the sort of thing that we were on the lookout for in the uh, 70s and 80s based on DDT poisonings. And this is what hawk watching accomplished. We were able to see declines in bald eagle populations, which led to the question, why aren't we seeing more young bald eagles? What's happening to the young bald eagles? Which got the researchers into the nests to see that these birds were indeed suffering from these deformities. So hawk watching data didn't tell us that their bills were deformed. Hawk watching data told us that their numbers were in decline, which led to the questions of why. It doesn't tell you that. It's not complete data. It just kind of gets you thinking about what's going on. From the standpoint of hawk migration, a lot of people, or migrations in general, a lot of people don't really have a grip on why it happens. Um, so we're going to kind of do a little bit of a, a fun role play. And this is an immature broadwing hawk, um, which is why it doesn't have that really standard black and white tail that so many people may be familiar with because it hasn't lived long enough to get it. The immature birds don't look like the adults. So this is an immature broadwing hawk. And uh, basically there's a timer that says it's time for them to go. And when I say time for them to go, it's time for them to get on the road and migrate. It is understood that we can't expect these birds to sit around and wait for their food to disappear. Oh, now I have to leave town. That doesn't work because if the birds wait for their food to disappear, then they're gonna starve. So there has to be some sort of a mechanism where these birds are motivated to move before their food disappears. So then the question becomes, well, what is that mechanism? Well, what we know it is not, is we know it's not temperature. And I have a toad picture here because the broadwing hawk is, uh, is great at eating toads and snakes and that sort of stuff. And if it were to wait for a cold snap, which were to put all the, uh, the toads down, now the broadwing hawk's got nothing to eat. So the mechanism that motivates mo uh, migration in birds of prey is not necessarily temperature. The mechanism is actually, believe it or not, photo period. Their timer in their head, the clock in their head is triggered by photo period. This is a huge thing, not only in, in, in uh, animals, but also in plants too. So in the case of these birds, their body is able to detect the shortening of the daylight. And when the days get shorter, it starts to trigger those urges for migration. On the flip side of the calendar, the lengthening of the daylight promotes the interest in these birds to move northbound. So as the days get longer in the springtime, they head north, as the days get shorter, they head south, and it's all linked to photo period. Uh, the length of daylight is a very, very, very big deal. This, uh, <laughs> this graphic is, uh, is uh, straight off the internet. Of course, I stole it. And it's, uh, it's Plinko uh, from The Price is Right. And if you're not sure what Plinko is, um, I'm perfectly comfortable telling you it's absolutely one of the stupidest games in the world. Um, there's absolutely no skill there's no knowledge, there's nothing required to play this game. And I don't say that with any disrespect to these game show contestants. All the individual at the top is doing is taking that red hockey puck there and she drops it down the platform and it bonks its way off these pins. And if she's lucky, she wins $10,000. If it's a bad day, she gets nothing. She has no control over anything. Um, you can literally train a dog to play this game. I mean, there's nothing to this game whatsoever. But this game actually becomes very, very important, believe it or not, in a few minutes. So one thing that we, uh, that we can think about is uh, that's the sun up there, the left-hand side. And that uh, green bar there is the landscape. And uh, this is millions of dollars in graphics here, so, so bear with me. Very, very expensive, very costly here. So the sun actually is going to beat its rays down onto the planet. And in doing so, the planet's going to warm up. And basically, we end up with these invisible columns of warm air 
and um, we're going to call them thermals. The idea is that if you go outside in September, for example, on a beautiful sunny morning, you may not actually see a lot of clouds. But then around 10 o'clock, you'll start to notice those big white puffy cumulus clouds. That's an indication that the thermals are forming. So when you see these big puffy clouds at 10 o'clock on a September morning, your thermal generation is rolling right along. The idea in terms of bird migration, specifically birds of prey, is as they're migrating, they're lazy. And a lot of these birds don't want to burn energy if they don't have to. So they end up flying into these thermals. And as they get into the thermal, because they're a, an animal with an absolutely spectacular build uh, for flight, they're literally pushed up in these thermals. And as they get pushed up into the thermals, of course, they're gaining altitude. And then they set their wings into a glide, kind of like a big paper airplane. And they literally glide over to the next thermal where they get pushed up in the sky again, where they glide over to the next thermal. And they can cover dozens of miles in a day by barely flapping. So the broadwing hawk, which is our great example bird, has what's considered a 10 to 1 ratio for flight versus uh, gliding. So 10 to 1 is 10 units of something horizontally for every one unit of something vertically. So to just go completely off the charts, if I had a broadwing hawk one mile high in the sky, and yes, they can get that high, in theory, on paper, you're looking at a bird that could glide without flapping its wings like a big paper airplane and cover upwards of 10 miles. That's incredible if you think about it. That's absolutely incredible. So by going up and down in these thermals, they're not flapping. If they're not flapping, they're not wasting any energy. And if they're not wasting energy, there's a better chance that they can get through the, the perils of migration because starvation would be an issue. Apparently, some studies have been done that suggest upwards of 70 miles a day for these broadwing hawks, and they're not flapping their wings. So what, are the, what does Plinko have to do with this? Well, with my super advanced graphics here, we now have the, uh, the blue, which is uh, water. And if you've ever tried to boil water on the stove, you know that it doesn't come to temperature quickly. So you can turn the unit hot. And you can burn your finger immediately if you touch the unit, but the water isn't hot. It takes a long time for water to warm up. Well, it turns out that these thermals do not form over open water. So what you end up with is you end up with a barrier because now these birds don't want to cross over open water. If they're going to cross over, you know, the Huron River, you know, that's not a big deal. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about dozens of miles of open water. It acts like a big block and prevents the birds from crossing because if they cross the open water, they have to flap. And if they have to flap, they're wasting energy. So their instincts tell them, I'm not crossing that lake. I'm going to go around it. So looking at this, uh, this image from uh, Google Earth, you can see the Great Lakes. You can see the Atlantic seaboard. And keeping that preposterous game of Plinko in mind, next thing you know, all the Great Lakes and the Atlantic seaboard become barricades. And as these birds are pouring south out of Canada, they go around the lakes. And as fate would have it, the southern portions of Ontario are shaped like a big funnel, like you would use in the kitchen, and it points directly to southeast Michigan. So we are literally seeing thousands and thousands of birds of prey over Southeast Michigan because of the shape of the Great Lakes. As fate would have it, this uh, geography is a very big deal for us. And that's why there's so many uh, hawk watches along uh, the Great Lakes shorelines. Hawk migration in Nebraska, for example, isn't a similar sort of a thing. Or in Iowa, it's not like we get because you don't have these shorelines that concentrate these birds of prey. So uh, a lot of the hawk watches are going to be along the Atlantic seaboard. They're going to be around the Great Lakes. In a sense, if I were to go buy a lot of concrete and fill up the Great Lakes, 
Um, yes, it would be a lot of concrete, but just work with me here. If I were to fill up the Great Lakes with concrete, I've destroyed what we know about the Great Lakes and how they impact hawk migration because the birds won't fly over Lake Erie Metro Park anymore. They don't have to. Spring migration works the same way. So as the birds are moving northbound, it's just the same concept. Thermals don't form over water, except the routes that these birds are taking is a little bit different. Uh, so you have different hawk watch sites in the spring than you do in the fall. But the same concept, lots of concrete, and we don't have spring hawk watch sites on the Great Lakes anymore. Now, I've been emphasizing in that previous slide all this idea of Great Lakes, Great Lakes, Great Lakes. Well, it's not all Great Lakes stuff. So I have this, uh, this image of this bobsled, and in case you're not sure what's happening there, it's moving from uh, left to right. And these things are like rockets, the way they go shooting down these, uh, these tracks. Um, in a sense, you get a similar sort of, of an effect on the mountains, uh, like the Appalachians, or some of the places out west for that matter, the Rocky Mountains or the, the Go Shoots and places like that. So when the winds are coming from the west or the northwest, it literally hits the side of the mountain and the force of the wind carries straight up the side of the mountain. So now the bird can literally tuck its wings and it just gets uh, launched down the mountain range, not down the side of the mountain, but down the mountain range from north to south. And it just goes like a bullet right down the mountains. So if you come to a place like uh, Hawk Mountain, this is one of the, uh, literally one of the most famous Hawk Watch sites in the world. And if you have not been there, you must go. You just, you have to do it. It's that kind of a place. It is a wonderful spot. And with these dots that are going to appear here in a moment, keep in mind, west is to your left. These birds come rocketing towards you. They come straight at you. And if they get too far away from the mountainside, they don't benefit from that wind burst that literally lifts them up and shoots them down the mountain. It is because that they, they come so close to the mountainside that the origins of Hawk Mountain literally center on hawk shooting. These birds are so close to you that in the early 20th century, these hawks were getting shot. They're close enough where you could take one with a shotgun, which does not have an impressive range. So the dynamics of hawk migration at a mountaintop site are not the same as they are at a lakeside site. This is uh, the Lower Detroit River, and that red star in the middle is the boat launch at Lake Erie Metro Park. And this white or these yellow arrows are just kind of like a a generic flight line as these birds are coming out of Canada. Now you might be thinking, oh, wait a minute, Paul, that's four miles of open water. Do the birds, you know, they don't want to do that. At this point, they're committed. They don't have a choice. If they've come down the center of Ontario, they can, they're high enough where they realize that I can't get to Ohio from Ontario. That's too far. But if I can actually just continue to go to the west, I'll cross that river. It's not that far and they are committed. So they make their way across the river. It's really quite simple. The wonderful thing for us on the Michigan side is as these birds are crossing over the water, they are losing altitude. <clears throat> so they are literally at a lower altitude on the Michigan side than they are on the Ontario side. Frustratingly though, winds can play into all of this. So if the winds are from the, uh, from the south, the flight lines will actually get pushed north if the winds are from the north, the flight lines can actually get pushed south. It's very frustrating, I'll admit it, when you're at the Hawk Watch site and you can't move and you're watching the flight lines shift out of sight, you can't do it. Well, here's the twist, you can do it. The counters currently can. So you wanna jump in your car and go to another location up or down river, go do it. You don't have to stay at the boat launch. The official staff does. It's also worth mentioning on an extremely minor note that that red star up there in the corner is approximately where I live. That's not important. What's important is that because I live there, I have seen Hawkwatch flights fly over my house. Do not think that you must be at Lake Erie Metro Park to see this, or you must be at Elizabeth Park in Trenton or the headquarters of the game area 
Flat Rock, Rockwood, New Boston, Huron Township, Trenton, Wyandotte, all these downriver communities have experienced hawk flights. So if you live in the southeast corner of Wayne County, keep your eyes looking up, get your face out of your phone, look up, and you will be amazed at the possibility of bird migration that you can see over your, uh, right over your house, right over your house. One of the things to look for from a, a weather standpoint is, uh, is a cold front. The birds do not come before the cold front, they come after it. So if the cold front passes on a Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday have the potential to be pretty exciting. For the record, southeast winds tend to be a bust. If there's southeast winds, stay home and do your laundry. If the, um, if the cold front passes across the state like so, that's what's going to bring the birds in. Be aware that um, these videos were just shot with an iPhone. There's nothing magical going on here. And I want to show this first video on the left. And this was uh, filmed in my front yard uh, a couple of years ago in September. And you'll notice that there seems to be kind of like a swirling motion, almost like a tornado, kind of like a, a Wizard of Oz kind of a thing. Those birds are in the thermal. They're literally in the thermal and they're getting that free lift, okay? This middle video is the thermal right over my head. So that swirling motion is me looking up into the middle of the kettle. And that's what these swirling birds of prey are called. Uh, they call them kettles. Um, so this swirling motion is this premise that they're pushed up into the sky and I'm literally right below it to see it. It's almost like they were getting lift off the parking lot here at my, uh, my building. The video on the, on the extreme right, um, I hope answers the question, how do you count these birds? And if you are seeing the yellow line, that's okay. Uh, Brittany and I were talking about this before the program started. She goes, is there supposed to be a yellow line there? Yes, there is. Because when, uh, when you count birds of prey, if you count them like you do in, in videos one and two, you can't do it because your brain's going to go nuts and it, it doesn't work. What happens is when these birds get to the top of the, um, of the thermal, they leave the thermal and they go over to the next one. It's an effect that we call streaming. And when they're streaming, you grab uh, in your mind an imaginary line and put it in the sky. And when the birds cross the line, you count it with a hand flicker. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to push the button. And then I want you to just see how these birds move across this yellow line. And then you'll get a feel for how the counting is done. And then I'm going to tell you how many I counted. So here goes. So all these birds at the bottom of the screen are not counted yet. We don't count them until they cross the yellow line. I'm not even going to tell you how many there are yet. We're going to wait till the end. Wait till the end. Don't let me forget, Brittany, okay? Don't let me forget. <laughs> so I actually wanted to see if you could do it one more time here for a second, but give of people course. a couple of tips outside of the line. I know when I've counted, counted birds before, one of the things that they've always taught me, and you might have different pointers, is don't try to count them individually. Because if you try to go one, two, three, four, five, you're going to lose count. You're going to miss a bunch. You won't be able to keep sure. up because it, when you have this many, it you have to come up with kind of like in your head, I count in groups of five or 10 or depending sure. on how big it is. Yeah. It's like, do you have tips? Yeah, there, there are tips. Um, and in terms of not counting them as individuals, there are times when you can absolutely do that. Literally one, two, three, four. The thing is, is you're not sitting there saying out loud, one, two, three, four. You have a hand clicker. And all you have to do is see the bird and trigger the button, and you don't have to worry about if you're on number 941 or 942. And then you just read the number off the clicker. When things start to go really bad, which is good in hawk watching, which means there's a lot of birds, um, then you can start doing your counts of estimating 
you know, fives and tens at a time. And you can actually have multiple clickers on the table ready to go. So this is my singles clicker. This is my tens clicker. This is my twenties clicker or whatever strategy the counters are using. Um, the worst case scenario, which is the best case scenario, is when the birds are so, um, so strong numerically, you end up doing what are called block counts, where you look in your binocular field and you say, okay, I think I see 50. And then you count blocks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 10 times 50 is 500. I just counted 500 birds and you're done and you keep moving on down the stream. So those are strategies. When I do this, um, I find myself looking at the birds in small groups. So if you listen to my clicking, my clicking isn't consistent. Um, it's kind of like one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, that sort of business. And again, the clicker is just doing its thing. I'm not actually counting per se so much as I'm just counting the buttons. So I'm gonna play that video again so you guys can try it again. All right, and I'll, I'll give you the number later. I'll give you the number later. Keep you guys in suspense. All right, so when it comes to hawk watching, um, there's Lake Erie Metro Park, and then these broadwing hawks, they've got some traveling to do. They have to get all the way down to um, South America. And in doing so, they actually get counted in Corpus Christi, Texas, and then they get counted again in Veracruz, and then they get counted again in Panama before they end up down in the northern reaches of South America. All these hawk watchers are doing all the same things. They're counting, they have their protocols, it's citizen science, can't change the protocols, generate data, see what the numbers tell you, or at least see what the numbers suggest they're telling you. Um, when it comes to these graphics here, this illustrates a very, very, very important idea. And that is, is not all hawk migration occurs uh, this even flow over three months. The standard question we get here all the time is, hey, when's the best time to see the hawks? And the same answer that the public doesn't want to hear is which hawks are you talking about? Because each hawk is on its own timeline. So if you look on the left side there, uh, you come down towards the bottom and you'll see the broad wing hawks. They're absolutely positively done by the middle of October. They are done, done, done. The bulk of them fly in a period of about a week in the middle of September. If you go completely to the right on the same level where the golden eagle is, you'll notice that there are no basically September records for golden eagle. So each bird has its own flight season. You look at something like uh, Northern Harriers or Cooper's Hawks, you have the potential to see them basically for the entire year. So each bird has its own, uh, its own possibilities, its own, its own flight timelines. I threw those two black lines up there to illustrate an idea. That first and second week of October is where you have the possibility of early birds being late and late birds being early. And you end up with the chance of seeing 16 species of birds in the same day. Um, it has happened. Uh, do not expect it to happen regularly, but it absolutely has happened. Um, it's a pretty, uh, pretty cool thing to see. A couple things to consider as well. Um, all these birds, uh, the birds of prey, these hawks, um, they're using the thermals. They'll, they'll use them, but they don't rely on them. So the broadwing hawk must have them. If they do not have... Um, any thermals, they can't make their migration as they know it. They won't survive it. A northern harrier will absolutely use a thermal, but will, according to its own decision making, not use a thermal. They don't care. If, the, if it's there, they'll take it. If it's not there, they'll just slug along. And they don't care about flying over open water, as is the case here. The rough legged hawk is another great example. Rough legged hawks could fly over Lake Erie and not care. We know for a fact that they'll fly right off of Whitefish Point 
in the springtime in Michigan's upper peninsula and then just keep trucking right along. They they simply don't care about open water. It's also important to keep in mind that different birds have different uh, life uh, strategies and some don't have to fly as far as others. So for example, a Swainson's hawk will absolutely go to South America, whereas a red-tailed hawk migration might be 150 miles and they'll call it a day. So each bird has its own idea of what South is going to be. It is also important if you do some readings about hawk watching, you are going to hear a lot of references about Northwest winds. That does not apply to Lake Erie Metro Park. The reason is simple. A lot of the early literature and a lot of the more recent literature for that matter has a bias uh, to the Appalachians where indeed Northwest winds are a benefit. But if you were to have a Northwest wind at Lake Erie Metro Park, it'll be great, but guess what? So's a Northeast wind and so's a West wind. And for that matter, I've seen great flights on East winds. So at Lake Erie Metro Park, we'll take anything. Whereas at a place like Hawk Mountain, for example, they absolutely like their Northwest winds. There's no two ways about it. Some quick ID stuff. And before I uh, fly through these graphics here, um, I want to introduce, uh, no pun intended, I want to um, uh, highlight the red frames. Those are what we call practice birds or what I call practice birds. A lot of hawk migration uh, and a lot of hawk identification is really funny stuff like the cadence of the wing beat or um, uh, how stiff the wing is or um, uh, the shape of the bird at three quarters of a mile away, that sort of stuff. All the birds that I'm sharing with you in red are readily found um, in Southeast Michigan, and you can literally practice with them throughout the year if you wanted to. Um, I also want to credit uh, Jerry Jordan and Andy Sturgis because they secured uh, all these photos. So a couple things to consider. Uh, three big dark birds, turkey vultures, very common. Uh, those two-toned wings, that absolutely handsome bald head. Um, and that those wings in a V, uh, very identifiable bird at a distance. It's important to note bald eagles and golden eagles are actually very, very easy to separate if you get a good look at them. Fundamentally, their shape is actually quite different and the pattern of the white is never a match. So um, if you have an adult bald eagle, hey, everybody knows that one. I mean, a, a preschooler knows what a bald eagle looks like. But if it's an immature bald eagle, that's when white patterns start to change, but it'll never match what you see on a golden eagle. So take a couple minutes and review those and you'll see they're actually quite different. And the fact that they're both quote unquote eagles, the similarity basically ends there. Um, when it comes to the occipiters, the Cooper's hawk is your go-to bird. I remember when I started bird watching in college, which was 5,000 years ago, the Cooper's Hawks were, um, actually about 30 years ago, the Cooper's Hawks were starting to return to the suburbs. You're looking at a bird that was in some troubles, but they're actually, I won't say they're commonplace, but it's a lot easier to find Cooper's Hawks around in the summertime breeding now than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. If you are in Southeast Michigan and it is June, and you see a sharp shin hawk, you did not. It is almost certainly the Cooper's hawk, I guarantee it. Uh, the wing beat is different. The way the head sticks out or doesn't stick out, as the case may be, the length of the tail, all those things play into it. And simply, sharp shin hawks don't breed here. So even though we see tens of thousands potentially of sharp shin hawks, they don't breed in Southeast Michigan. Um, the occipiter that I didn't show is the uh, northern goshawk, and quite frankly, we get a raw deal on those. We're too far south, and we just don't get as many as we want. Um, if you wanted to see lots of goshawks, I do encourage a road trip to the western end of Lake Superior. Um, Hawk Ridge sees plenty, plenty of goshawks. The Budios are... Um, are uh, a species that have that kind of a generic hawk shape. They don't have pointy wings like falcons. They don't have long tails like occipiters. It's kind of a more generic shape that benefits them for soaring. The red-tailed hawk is your practice bird. They're everywhere. 
be aware, depending on exactly where you live, you can find red-shouldered hawks as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my wife and I live in New Boston, and we have them nesting in our neighborhood. And they've nested there for years, I'm sure. So uh, you can find them in the summertime. And yes, they do have red shoulders, but interestingly enough, you don't use that field mark when you're identifying them in the field. Um, you're looking for these panels, these crescent-shaped panels at the tips of their wings. That's actually better than looking for a red shoulder. Rough-legged hawks are Arctic birds. Don't hold your uh, breath for those. You're not going to see them basically until Halloween. Um, as I state there with the, the graphics there at the end, um, the calendar is inside insider trading. So here goes. I'm going to give you a hawk watching tip that nobody likes it when I share it, but I'm going to do it. You pay attention to the calendar. So when you go to the hawk watch on September 1st, in theory, you have your list in your head of the birds that you would expect to see or possibly see. If you go to the hawk watch on September 1st and you think you're going to see a golden eagle, you're not. Don't expect it. You could, but it would be agonizingly rare. So that calendar comes into play with the rough-legged hawk. It's September, you know, 15, and you're struggling to figure out if it's a red-tailed hawk or a rough-legged hawk. The calendar is giving you a clue. It's a red-tailed hawk because the rough-legged hawks aren't here yet. That rule is not cast in stone, but it is a helpful thing to consider. Uh, falcons are the same way. Uh, pointy wings, your practice bird, believe it or not, is the uh, peregrine. They nest all over the place now. Uh, Mount Clemens has them. Uh, Detroit has multiples. Monroe has them. Ann Arbor has them. Uh, when I was in graduate school a few years ago, um, they were investigating uh, the water tower in Ypsilanti. Um, so uh, peregrines are your practice bird, believe it or not. Pointy, pointy wings. Nobody else really has wings like this. It's really quite something. The wing beat, um, Kestrel, for example, it's kind of got this, um, this rowing motion sort of as it moves as opposed to peregrines, which it's almost hypnotizing the way their wings are, are just sm so smooth and fluid. Practice with your peregrines. Merlins, uh, they just hate everybody. And that's actually a clue because they'll take pot shots at all the other birds of prey in the sky. It's really kind of fun to watch. Uh, Northern Harrier and Osprey kind of get their own slide because they're goofy and they don't have anybody else like them. The Harrier is one of those birds where he doesn't care about the weather. Uh, I should say they don't care about the weather, male, female, young, old, doesn't matter. Um, they don't care about the weather. Snow, rain, hawk watchers are going home and having a hot coffee and Harry's a migrant. They don't care. Um, but they have the capacity to fool you. So they can look like a Cooper's hawk, believe it or not. They can look like a peregrine, believe it or not. So they are a little bit on the tricky side. Ospreys are a great practice bird because they nest right outside the front gate of Lake Erie Metro Park. Uh, uh, check any cell tower near you there's a great chance there's going to be an osprey sitting on it. Um, easy to confuse the osprey with the rough-legged hawk if you're not careful, but guess what? You can use the calendar again. First six weeks of the season, it's an osprey. Second six weeks of the season, uh, it's likely to be the rough-legged hawk. Very rarely do they share the sky together. If you think your bird is a gull, and then you're fumbling with it thinking, I wonder if that's really a bird of prey. It's probably going to be an osprey. Ospreys look like giant gulls. Something to consider. You got to be wondering what this graphic is here for. Comerica Park. And we do we even talk about the tigers anymore? I don't know. But when it comes to uh, when it comes to um, hawk migration, I think of it as uh, as a baseball game. And there are times when your baseball game is just roaring and you don't even want to walk 150 yards to the bathroom because you don't want to miss something. And that's just the nature of hawk migration. Sometimes it's on 10 and it is so exciting and so ramped up and everybody's having a great time and the birding is wonderful. And then there are times when hawk migration is a drag. And there are times when you should be home doing anything else. I don't care what you're doing at home. It's better. 
So keep in mind that hawk migration ebbs and flows, and sometimes it's roaring, and sometimes it's just not. It's also important to consider that because Lake Erie is a uh, metro park, is tucked away in the corner of uh, Lake Erie at the mouth of the Detroit River, and it's this mishmash of flyways for waterfowl and birds of prey and songbird migration, you get all sorts of other birds that'll fly by. Sometimes they are raptors. So there's uh, a record of a Mississippi kite in 2009. Black vulture records. There's actually multiple Lake Erie Metro Park black vulture records. And even though they are a vulture, they look completely different than a turkey vulture, believe it or not. So it's worth uh, uh, taking a few minutes and reading how to separate those because maybe you'll be the one that will find the next black vulture. Other birds that have shown up include a, a northern gannet, which has absolutely no business being on Lake Erie, but it's happened. And the one that is absolutely the most preposterous record of them all, um, as far as the Lake Erie Metro Park Hawk Watch, is a lesser frigate bird that flew by and was photographed by some clown who looks a lot like me. And it turns out that that bird was the second North American record. It, it was not a magnificent frigate bird. It was a lesser frigate bird as determined by experts based on the photographs. It's an incredible, incredible record. Other juicy non-birds of prey, uh, gull-billed tern, parasitic Jaeger, cave swallow, lark sparrow, a Franklin's gulls, an anhinga, it's incredible what can come by a hawk watch. And I encourage you to spend some time there and see what's going on. If you want to see what's going on with other hawk migration sites, go to the Hamana website. Uh, hawk Migration Association of North America is this giant database, uh, or it's an organization that accommodates a giant database for hawk watch data from all across the country. Go to the website and check them out. Go do it, go do it. You can also go to Hawk Count, and that will give you some insight in terms of um, the feeds from all the different Hawk Watches across the country. So every night before you go to bed, you can check the internet and see what all these Hawk Watches have recorded for that day. It's really quite something. When you come to uh, the Hawk Watch, uh, do bring a chair. There's a, unless you wanna stand there for eight hours, I mean, it's up to you. Um, there are some picnic tables, but sometimes people have their own comfort chair, and that's cool. Do not forget uh, sun protection, whatever it is you're going to wear, you know, long sleeves, hat, sunscreen, what have you. I say appropriate weather gear because it depends on the season. Um, there are times when it's Labor Day weekend and the Hawk Watch has started because the count starts September 1, and uh, it's 90 degrees, and you're just going to melt. And by the time you're waiting for a golden eagle to fly by on Thanksgiving Day, it could be, you know, 10 degrees. There's no telling. So be prepared for the weather and be aware that because you're on the edge of a lake, it's a lot colder here than it is at your house. And you can, you can take that to the bank. I've been going to this hawk watch for a long time, and I still don't dress right because I still can't seem to remember that it's always colder here. So be aware. Uh, food, bring your own food. There's actually, you know, fast food within just a couple miles of the park. All good. You got to have binoculars. Any Hawk Watch site will tell you that. If you have a spotting scope, bring it because there are times when the birds are too far away for folks to get a satisfactory look with binoculars. And don't forget to bring your field guides too, whether it's books or all stuffed into your phone, whatever. Bring um, information with you so you can apply it when you're finally at the Hawk Watch site. So if I did all this correctly, I think I can stop sharing my screen. And Brittany and I worked this out where she was going to do some of the mediating of the questions. Yeah. So Sweet. before we get into that, I'll just lightly mention, um, for those of you, obviously you're here because you're interested in Hawks. Um, Paul, if you happen to have any other events coming up that relate to Hawks in any way, feel free to talk about it. I know here at Detroit Audubon, we actually have two Wayne County, uh, Wayne campus urban, uh, birding walks that, 
Um, there's actually a pair of peregrine falcons that have been nesting nearby on campus all summer. We'll point out where, the, where they nest, talk about benefits of urban birding, what you might see, what you can do to help. Um, but that way you know where the nesting is and that way in the future whenever they come in the spring you can actually just pop out a chair and just watch them come in and out as they catch birds which is always really fun. Um, another one that we're doing coming up, um, we actually do it monthly, is our Elmwood Cemetery walks and you wouldn't think too much about it but Elmwood Cemetery there's actually a nesting pair of red tail hawks and Cooper's hawks that both are almost regularly there. Uh, since I've been starting leading, co-leading those for the last 10 months or so, I don't think I've gone a single time without seeing at least a hawk, whether it was the Coopers or the, the red tail. Um, and there's actually a leucistic red tail hawk that has been there all summer. Um, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's not full albino, it's partial albino. Um, and so that's always a really fun opportunity if you want to see them a little bit closer up before the hawks start migrating. But uh, Paul, did you have anything to chime in with that? Yeah, in terms of uh, uh, bird stuff here at uh, Lake Erie Metro Park, um, we have Hawk Fest, which is coming up in September. That's gonna be the third weekend. I believe it's 16, 17 or 17, 18. I don't have a calendar handy. It's that third weekend in September. Um, always has been, always will be. Um, and that whole weekend is all birds of prey stuff, programs indoors, programs outdoors, crafts for kids, all that stuff. It's our big festival. This is our basically our first year back after COVID. Last year was a smaller abbreviated kind of an event. We didn't even call it Hawk Fest because we knew it wasn't Hawk Fest, but we had a guest speaker out with some birds. The year before we did nothing. So, uh, which of course, nobody did anything. So um, <laughs> this year we're doing it for real. In terms of birding in general, uh, we do a, a, a birds in your binoculars uh, a field program every month. Go out and find whatever it is, songbirds or what have you. The advantage of doing the birds in your binoculars programs in the fall is we're looking up as much as we're looking out. So we're looking for warblers and thrushes and all that stuff. And we can always look up and say, there goes a cooper hawk, there goes a bobbing hawk or what have you. Um, and once we get into the latter part of the fall, uh, here at Lake Erie Metro Park and also at Oakwoods Metro Park, there's going to be some owling going on with owl prowls and things like that. So um, you are not at a loss to secure bird oriented programs at uh, Lake Erie Metro Park. That's just a fact or the Metro Parks in general. Yeah, perfect. So to kind of start delving into some of the questions, um, Josette, she put, if the birds are migrating for food, why did they leave where they migrate from? It would seem that there would still be food there. So why do they migrate back up north? That's a super question. And I, I gather that that's the kind of thing that uh, ornithologists are still trying to get a grip on. One of the things that they've done, they, the ornithologists, is they've kind of reevaluated our vocabulary based on what we know. And we're no longer saying that birds fly south for the winter. Uh, what we're actually starting to consider is that birds fly north to breed. Um, so in the case of like a scarlet tanager, or in our case, a broad winged hawk, they spend a large part of their life uh, south of here. And then they spend a second significant part of their life flying back and forth. And only a portion of their life is quote unquote up north. How that came to be and why it came to be is still kind of being tinkered with, but one of the ideas actually has to do with the glaciers, actually, where the birds were, um, I'm making up generalized locations now, but the birds were in the, what we would consider the central United States, and they would fly south a few hundred miles, and they weren't in Michigan because Michigan was covered by ice. So then as the glaciers retreated, the habitats follow the glaciers and the birds have in their head, I still have to find my habitat and now it's 20 miles away from where it was last year. So they move farther north and the glaciers keep retreating and the habitats keep retreating. And next thing you know, these migrations are getting longer and longer and longer. 
So as time goes by, the next thing you know, these birds have these absolutely preposterous migrations and it's all they know. And they're kind of they're kind of like programmed little computers and it's all they know. So they just go with what they know. Their brain says my habitat is now 3000 miles away, damn it. And now I gotta go find it. And that's what they do. Even though there's food involved, they're basically changing their diets, which is what a lot of animals do anyways. So the question on paper is a very straightforward and very good question, but in reality, it's very complicated and they're still trying to figure it out, believe it or not. Thank you for that. That's, it's always fun to learn some new things. So the next one's by Laura. She said, I have red tail hawks by my house. Just got photos today of one in a tree. Red tail when the sun lit it up. They are screeching every day. I'm not sure why. That's how I found it in the tree. I follow the sound. Any idea why they are screeching every day? Saw today, possibly a third. Yeah, if I was uh, uh, gonna lay a bet, I would say the screeching is the youngsters. Um, and the uh, and the, they are screeching at their adults uh, begging for food. Um, that sort of behavior is going to be winding down very quickly, and those little ones are going to be on their own. Um, it is worth mentioning that the um, any wild animal, I don't care what you are, you could be a, a bird of prey, you could be a, a crayfish, it doesn't matter. Uh, life is brutal. Um, and for a bird of prey, the um, expected mortality in that first year of life is approximately 80 to 90 percent. So eight or nine out of 10 birds of prey do not survive their first year. So these birds are screaming because they're trying to get their food. And in a couple of weeks, they're going to be on their own. And the statistics are not pretty. So we'll have to wait and see how it works out for them. Obviously, we all hope it works out well. But that is what's happening. It's the youngsters looking for their last free meals because in a few weeks they're on their own. Is there a best time of day to see the migration? Great question. Um, if you think back to the slides, there's the, um, uh, the graphics with the sun and how the sun heats up the land. So it's all about the sun in some capacity. So what's happening is the hawk watch basically starts at eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning depending on the season. And by 10 o'clock in the morning, things are really starting to ramp up because the sun is getting high enough in the sky. So the answer I typically give is banker's hours. The hawk watch is basically nine to five, um, at least old banker's hours because everything's on the internet anymore. But uh, it's basically nine to five. If you have this vision of, of oh, I got to get up stupid early like I do for warblers in the springtime, hawk watching does not work like that. You can you can literally get up, throw a load of laundry in, go out to breakfast, and if you're at the hawk watch by 9:30, you probably didn't miss very much. Be aware though that birds like um, peregrine falcons and northern harriers they'll fly at sunrise. So in theory, yeah, you could miss a peregrine or something like that. But basically, just think banker's hours, 9 to 5, and you'll be fine. Something I want to chime in to everyone just as a, a reminder for everyone's safety is um, we all love looking at birds. I know I, I won't lie myself. Um, always remember if you're out driving and you see birds flying overhead, make sure you pull over and park your car for the safety of you and everyone else on the road just because it is my husband constantly has to remind me to pay attention to the road because yes. the birds are very distracting and I want to look at them and so I remind for myself but also for everyone else just make sure that you see the birds just pull over <laughs> good, good, good plan <laughs> yeah <laughs> um Sharon put where is the mountain hawk site you showed in the beginning the mountain hawks uh the hawk mountain uh, oh, the Hawk Mountain slides. Um, the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary is in eastern Pennsylvania. Um, I don't remember the, the name of the closest town. It might be like Dreyersville, I believe. Um, but it's, uh, it's about an hour and a half or so outside of Philadelphia. It's north and east of, the Phil of Philadelphia. Um, if you were to leave Metro Detroit right now, you, uh, your drive is in the order of seven hours or something like that. It's Eastern Pennsylvania. 
Wonderful. A few people thanked for the presentation. Then Thanks Laura. For yeah, Laura said last year was awesome. We sat with the watchers a couple different days, enjoyed the ladies who brought out the birds for the event. My favorite was the red tailed hawk. Right on. Um, and then she also thanked for the answers. Josette has, has the park ever considered videoing migration so it would be easier to count? It's my understanding that that kind of a thing has been, uh, has been tinkered with. Um, I don't know where it stands. Um, I'm not actively involved with the admin of the Hawk Watch anymore. And I know since I departed, um, there's been some um, there's been some more tech kind of stuff um, that they've been uh, toying with. I don't know. Uh, fundamentally, what we do with the the counters and the binoculars, I mean the hand counters and the binoculars, it's been uh, it's been working for decades. And one thing to consider is, and this is gonna kind of sound weird, but these counts aren't accurate anyways because they're all undercounts. So if we were to say it was 100,000 broadwings, it was not 100,000 broadwings, it was more than 100,000 broadwings. So then what if the video shows that it was 105,000 broadwings? Is that really that big of a difference to warrant all this extra capacity with the tech? I, I don't know one way or the other, maybe it's a conversation that can be had, but to the best of my knowledge, I'm not 100% sure. Oh yeah, Josette said, don't forget to give us the number. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Josette. <laughs> yeah, I, I forgot all about it. The, the number that I came up with was, uh, was 186. 186. Okay. So, all right, everybody, 186. Feel free to put in the comments what some of you counted and we'll uh, go over that in a second. But um, while we do that and give everyone a chance, Linda put, where can we find the calendar of which birds are expected to be seen when? I think you said there's a pattern. It's all on the, uh, it's all on the Detroit River Hawk Watch website. Um, if you go there, um, all the, uh, the updates and this, that, and the other, it's all there. Um, Detroit River Hawk Watch. I don't remember exactly what the, uh, the web address is, but just, um, just Google it and you'll get there. Cool. And Glenn actually clarified for everybody, Hawk Mountain is in Kempton, Pennsylvania. So it's K-E-M-P-T-O-N. Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds right. So yeah. And then um, Mary put, is Lake Erie Metro Park easy to navigate for a first timer? I, I certainly think so. Uh, the Metro Parks website, metroparks.com has all the maps. Um, once you come into the park, um you uh just follow the signs out to the boat launch and uh, it's pretty clearly marked and you park in the dirt parking lot there on the right you walk no fooling 75 yards to the picnic not even 75 yards to the picnic tables and set up and you're good um it's very very easy to get there um professionally respectfully speaking it's not like that at hawk mountain you have to walk three quarters of a mile up the mountain and you sit on boulders. Um, so all the Hawk Watches have different flair. Our place is pretty straightforward to both navigate from a standpoint of your car and your feet. So kind of, again, jumping back to, uh, you had said 186 was the number. Some of the yeah. numbers that people guessed were 175, 120, 125, 140. Um, so pretty decent numbers. Um, Kind of with that in mind, um, for those of you that may or may not be interested, so Paul, is there a way that people could get trained to participate in the citizen science program at Hawk Watch or um, whether it's through maybe Lake Erie Metro Parks, whatever it may be, do you have some tips and places to look it up? That's a great question. The, uh, the Hawk Watch is, is, it takes place here at Lake Erie Metro Park, but it's officially under the auspices of the Wildlife Refuge. So if somebody wanted to help in a, in a volunteer capacity, I would encourage that individual to reach out to Jesse at the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge. She's the biologist on staff, and she's the one who oversees the project now. She has a better understanding of what their, uh, of what their staffing needs are. 
I can tell you that the basic fundamentals have not changed. There is one individual who is the paid counter and he has a team of volunteers that are assigned to him on a daily basis, so-and-so on Monday, so-and-so on Tuesday. So there's a core group of people that have the official capacity to count the numbers and everybody else is just along for the enjoyment. But if you wanted to be one of those volunteers and get trained and that sort of thing, Jesse's the person you want to talk to. And just as another reminder, everybody, so this presentation has been recorded. Um, I do see a few people kind of jumping in at the last minute. Um, it was recorded. We're kind of tinkering towards the end of the, the presentation, um, but it will get shared to everybody that registered. Um, and so you will be able to watch it later. I'll share that. Um, it'll also be posted on the Detroit Audubon webpage and I'll share it with Paul so that way he can share it wherever he'd like to as well. Um, but we're kind of getting into the last of the questions. Does anyone want to type another question in? Maybe unmute yourself and ask Paul directly. And if not... If I can just interject one quick idea here. Um, I'm not going anywhere. Um, I work here. This is my place. So if you uh, had questions that will hit you tonight when you're going to bed or what have you, uh, shoot me an email, call me here at the museum, whatever. Um, this is not your only opportunity to interact with me. If you have more questions, you know where to find me. I'll be here. Wonderful. But uh, so far, no more questions. It is a 7.02, so it's a little after when we scheduled for this to end. Thank you so much for everyone joining us. We're really happy you could join us. And for those that are watching later, we're happy that you will have the opportunity to. But above all else, thank you so much, Paul, for joining us and thank giving this wonderful me. presentation. All right. Oh, viewing from Louisiana. Louisiana. Wow. It's cold <laughs> down there. Not really. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> it's not cold there at all. No. <laughs> Oh, but awesome. Well, I'll let everybody go and hopefully right. you'll all get to see this pre-recorded presentation sometime soon. All right. All right. Have Bye, a good everybody. Night, everybody. See you later, Brittany. See ya.